It's a puzzling world, is the world of international criminal tribunals. And a word or so about how I find myself there, because the perspective of a speaker is sometimes not unimportant. I was simply an ordinary lawyer who was a bit bored with what he was doing. And an interesting job came up that I could apply for and was fortunate enough to get. <coughs> I wasn't an expert aren't really, in international law. I wasn't a committed member of an NGO trying to prove that the world was either good in this way or bad in that way. I was just a technical lawyer presented with a really interesting task. And my background, let's see if I can work this excellent machine, I can. My background was that I was brought up in the 60s. Please, I was university in the 60s. Let's see if I can make it go. <laughs> there it is. The 60s, when the grandfatherly figure on the left look more like he does on the right. <laughs> do you know who it is? You do, Judge. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> then, um, at the same time, you can't really see them. There's a band up there on the left. I think they call the Beatles. <laughs> and this was the swinging 60s in which, good gracious me, this would be the sort of badge we'd wear. Make love, not war, with an emblem saying, ban the bomb, stuck in the middle of it. It was an age when uh, and this is, of course, uh, number 10 Downing Street, the bobby, the policeman, didn't carry a gun, and they didn't have to protect themselves against, as you can see, there's a young terrorist there, <laughs> they, they didn't have to protect themselves from him by armed guns, as they do now. The world has, to some extent, changed. And although that's the way I was brought up, and I've lived through the intervening decades where we've seen not just Vietnam, but all sorts of other developments, most recently, of course, in the Balkan War, so far as I'm concerned, it was only late in the day, and really as a result of working in these tribunals, that my naive 60s mentality grew to understand the wisdom of a man called Dr. Johnson, who, um, when I can find him, uh, there he is, who said, sometime between 1709 and 1784, he said, every man thinks meanly of himself, who has not been a soldier or been at sea. Because, of course, one of the things that any contact with conflict of the kind that you're exploring in your course here, or that I had to explore in the three cases I prosecuted in The Hague, it, one realizes that it is but an eggshell of civilization upon which we tiptoe, and that it is in fact maintained, not by lawyers, not by judges, maybe by politicians, but certainly by the soldiers and the police. And it, however unfashionable that would have been for me to say, sporting my ban the bomb badge in the 1960s, it is a hard and irrefusable reality. But let me try and pro provoke thought in you. I'm not, I don't come to you with answers, I don't have answers. Let me try and provoke thought in you by looking at uh, a little bit of the three cases I did, and then perhaps we'll have a discussion, uh, and that may prove the most interesting for you, I don't know. Um, there may be other people in this room who will be able to contribute to the discussion. Um, some of you I know come from the region, and some of you have, I know, done some study. So I should have to simply show you the map of the um, former Yugoslavia, there it is, and turn very rapidly, um, without bothering with the detail of the conflict, because I, uh, you either know it or you don't need to know it for these purposes, and turn to the very first of the three people I prosecuted, a man possibly none of you will have even heard of, Dario Kordic. Anybody here heard of him? One. Dario Kordic 
was a Bosnian Croat, tried for offences committed in Bosnia against Muslims. Three things about that trial, three short things. But first of all, let's look at Dario Cordic. There he is. Not a very large, imposing figure. 30 at his rise to power, 31 at the time of the offences he committed. Looks a bit older at trial, but that, that's actually the age he was. Now what was interesting to me, and one of the great things about the job I had, is that almost anybody would talk to you. Either because they had to, or because they wanted to. And so you could go to the places where Dario Cordage had been a terrifying presence. A man who, as his motorcade drove down from his eerie in the woods, people had to stand back from the road, get in their houses. Look at him, that! He'd been the editor of the local factory's in-house magazine. Nothing wrong with that, perfectly good job. But he wasn't a rising politician or a, a, a charismatic figure, necessarily. And I asked one or two of the members of the local intelligentsia, teachers and so on, and I said to them, how could you have so allowed things to happen? Because, of course, this was a, a part of the former Yugoslavia with, of course, a functioning process of elections. How could you allow this back to have you cowering in your houses? And the answer, which I found um, um, unforgettable, however guilelessly, however innocently given, was, well, we always thought when it was necessary to stop him, we could, but then it was too late. And it's a message to the power of democracy, I suppose, to control the worst of excesses. But it's a stronger message of the need to be actively engaged in democracy. Because these people thought, well, we have a democratic system. When we need to set this man aside, we can. But before that happened, he had taken over in the little area where he lived. The second thing about this trial, which lasted two and a half years, I suppose, very little heard of it, was that I discovered in the course of it that four trials of this kind, the most important asset you can ever have is documents. People may lie, typically they will. Documents tell the truth. And when we reviewed the case, which had been comparatively successful, we realized that it was documents and little else that had made the difference. And let me just go back in time, shall we, just to, um, there he is, a trial. That's the bit of Bosnia he was involved with, the Lashley Valley. That's the mosque at Armici, which was the famous emblemic, I suppose, emblematic uh, picture of uh, what happened at Armici, uh, attributed to Darien Kordic. But let's go back here to the um, to the Nuremberg trials. There they all are. Um, there they all are again. There's Goering being cross-examined by uh, Justice Jackson. And 21 people were tried in about nine months. 18 were convicted and 11 were sentenced to death. And when you compare those statistics with the statistics about, for example, the Balkan trials, which I've been involved with, where everybody complains how long they were, one of the answers to the question, why do our trials take so long, why was this trial so quick, is because they had all the documents they needed. Indeed, they only called evidence, so it is said, by some, because the public galleries were empty and they needed to at least ensure some visible manifestation of interest in the trial. And to make a, a bit of a sandwich of this point, uh, a few weeks ago in um, Libya, in the conflict there, uh, the rebels, if that's what they are, or however you describe them, were tempted, of course, to burn 
destroy the buildings that reflected the regime against which they were rebelling. But somebody remembered that it was more important to raid the building of documents than it was to destroy the history of the regime. And if you read some of the local papers at the time, or indeed the English papers at the time, they managed to get some very good documents. Documents are what these trials rely on <laughs> if they are to be done well. The third point, um, and these are very disconnected points, but they're designed to give you things to think about. The third thing about the trial of Dario Cordic and the massacre at Armici uh, is that this chap, a lieutenant colonel called Bob Stewart, really demanded that this case be tried. Now, it was a serious case. Over 100 people were killed at Armici. But in terms of the conflict as a whole, that didn't make it, I, I regret to have to say, of course, particularly grey. But Stuart, who was and still is a personal self-publicist, nothing wrong with that, but a reality, made a great fuss and managed to get the matter brought to trial effectively by making a fuss. It might have been otherwise, it might not have been. And this is again a point of some general application. And it's important for all of us, as we read the press, the international press, and we see which conflicts are the subject of attention and which are not, to remember that publicity and self-publicity is at the moment playing a part in determining <coughs> what conflicts fall for international attention. For example, who's this? And this? And what is it that they have apparently revealed to the world? Darfur, which is an example of what crime? 